Hi everyone, I'm number one Marmaduke fan. This week I picked up Monsters Unleashed number seven at uh, for New Comic Book Day. I, I figured whatever. I thought this was a weird event with new Marvel heroes fighting monsters. Maybe I thought that because of that one Diversity in Comics video where he showed you know Gogurt Hulk fighting a giant monster. But uh, now that I know what the heck this is, I'm kind of interested. I I, I said on Twitter that I'm semi digging. Uh, I'm semi digging. Monsters Unleashed. It's given me some, you know, roast, you know, art that can be roasted a bit. It's given me some fun stuff I'm enjoying. And this one also started prompting me to think about feminism and male gaze theory. So I want to be careful not to go on a tangent about that. Maybe I'll say what that thought was first and then talk about the comic instead of talking about male gaze theory the whole time. The uh, thought I have is that this actually has some characters which break the mold of the creepy, Marvel characters who seem to have all their sexual characteristics erased. You know, there are some characters who look like boys, there are some characters who look like girls. And uh, I, then I start thinking about male you know, gaze theory, the, uh, the Hawkeye initiative. I remember all the art students in my class being totally on board with that and talking it up when that was first starting to be a thing. So I really resonated with the Diversity in Comics video talking about the Hawkeye initiative. Uh, and I started thinking about what I've read about male gaze theory, and here's, here's my thesis. I think that there is a division between mainstream feminists, you know, kind of girl power, Hillary Clinton voter, mainstream Democrat types, and the more woke, socialist, radical feminist types. And you could describe the mainstream feminists as it's girl power. They're in, they're interested in it because it's it's the thing to be be a woke feminist, right? And it it gets you points in in your progressive club around the cooler. And then the radicals are the ideologues who read this stuff, eat, live and breathe this stuff, care about this stuff, fight fight for this stuff. Uh, and so male gaze theory, I think. Oh, the, the pink hats, the pink hats people wore at the Women's March illustrate that. The mainstream types wore the pink hats because, you know, girl power, uh, they look like female genital genitals, those hats. And then the radicals would write articles about how problematic that is because pink's a gender, a, a female gender coded color. Uh, what It erases POC because POC don't have pink genitals. You're erasing uh, females who have male reproductive organs. So that's why I've said before, and I'll say again, that there's no peace within social justice. They, they're, they're constantly at war with one another, and they can't reconcile these differences or these ideas within their own minds. Therefore, when they try to persuade anyone else of social justice, well, which social justice are you trying to argue me into? Are you trying to argue me into sort of the generic Hillary Clinton pro cosmopolitan New York progressive circle? Or are you trying to talk me into the Antifa uh, riot, burn, pillage, and destroy section of social justice? Which is it? So this got me thinking about that. Uh, male gaze theory. So social justice and feminism are such big topics that are all encompassing. What, what clicked for me when I read this is that male gaze theory is probably the most important idea from feminism and social justice that's creeped its way into talking about comic books. And if I could point to one thing and say that's the key pillar that we have to talk about if we want to talk about social justice in comic books, what 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 should make a good comic book, what's moral or immoral about comic books. I think figuring out what feminists mean by male gaze theory is maybe priority number one, or at least maybe it's priority number one for me, since I read so much junk about these ideas in school. Too. And the, the takeaway I, I figured out is that uh, people mean different things when they talk about male gaze theory. If you hear the average person talk about male gaze theory, if you saw the Hawkeye Initiative, what male gaze theory seemed to mean was fan service. And if you've read any kind of manga for teenage boys, you know what fan service is. Uh, uh, Black Clover had some of this. You know, a girl shows up in a bikini for no reason at all, uh, but that it's obvious that Shonen Jump knows that its target demographic are teenage Japanese boys, and teenage Japanese boys like seeing 
you know, grown, you know, beautiful women in, in bikinis, right? And uh, the Hawkeye Initiative was about trying to point out fan service within superhero comics. And I've said before that sometimes I will see a grain of truth it, 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 within feminism, or I'll see a way that the argument can be understood rationally, and I, I, that I would buy the argument, but then that radicals and social justice warriors will always tend to take the argument too far. They'll start with the true thing, and then somehow they'll end up in, you know, resisting capitalism and overthrowing everything. You think, what? How'd, how'd you get from how'd you get from fan service being bad to just America needing to be overthrown? Well, a, from point A to point B. All right. So the, the, the I gotta stay on topic because dang it, I hate when I hate it and I love it when one of these comics starts me going down a crazy train of thought. What is the difference between how a lot of people? T what a lot of people think about when they talk about male gaze theory and what the feminist writers are talking about when they talk about male gaze theory. So the layman's definition of male gaze theory is fan service. And the reason that is kind of persuasive as an argument is if you're reading, you know, la di da di da, you're reading a nice comic book, you're enjoying the characters, and then suddenly, boom, there's a, you know, giant sort of soft core shot of of scantily clad ladies and then back to kind of normal fun adventure stuff that's a little weird it's a tone break it's sort of breaking you out of the world of the story it's sort of hitting you with the idea that hey hey this is a this is a comic for kids they love that for teenage boys they love themselves some you know some titillation right it, it breaks you out of the world of the story that's the point so when the left says we need to strip this sort of fan service stuff out of comics because it hurts the storytelling. They're making an argument that could actually persuade a lot of people because you want to just enjoy the story. You don't want to have fan service whap you over the head and break you out of your enjoyment of the story. Uh, Soul Eater is a good example of that. I love the Soul Eater anime. When I tried to read the manga, it was a little skeevy because the main girl character is like 14, and I don't want to see her in her underwear all the time, okay? I want to see, you know, if I, if I want to watch, read a story about, you know, little kid characters going on adventures, I want it to reflect the innocence of those kind of characters. And the anime, I thought, did a good job of toning that fan service stuff down and letting it be a story about characters. All right. Too many tangents. So, the, but the way that academic feminists talk about male gaze theory, <coughs> excuse me, is different. And I think you need to see Anita Sarkeesian talk about this in her video on strategic butt coverings to pick up the subtle distinction. So uh, when I've read kind of art history, you know, philosophical essays about male gaze, they don't mean uh, fan service, right? Uh, take, take fan service from manga or, you know, kind of over the top sexual, you know, jokes from comics and translate that in your mind to painting. What would be the equivalent of that in the history of painting? Well, the equivalent to that in the history of painting would probably be sort of Baroque, uh, you know, buxom ladies, you know, with frills, you know, bearing their backsides, and then the rich patron would hang this in his private library or his private study where no one was around. You, you catch my drift? So the equivalent of fan service in the history of art is that type of thing. So you would think that when feminists talk about the male gaze in art history, they'd be focusing on kind of soft core, uh, you know, nudity type of paintings where the only point of the painting is for people who, who want to look at some, at some nude bodies, right? But they mean a lot more by male gaze theory than that. So uh, I've seen uh, art historians you discuss male gaze theory in relation to paintings of the Virgin Mary, where she's completely covered from head to toe. And they'll argue that it's an example of male gaze because her face is pretty. And the assumed viewer is always a male viewer. And so the question that raised in my mind when I saw a feminist applying male gaze theory to a completely G-rated painting of the Virgin Mary is, wait a second, I thought male gaze was about kind of sexual stuff, about objectifying women, but it, it goes much deeper than that. And the reason I think this is important is this gets at the idea that the left will never be happy. You can 